When you think of survival horror as a video game genre, you probably first think about something like Resident Evil or Silent Hill, and I wouldn't blame you if you do, I do it too. These series go all the way back to 1996 and 99 respectively, they're both pioneers of the genre, each having their own means of terrifying the player. <laughs> But I'd wager that you, yes you watching right now, might be unaware of a series that even predates Resident Evil. One that would serve as a major inspiration for it, in fact. That series is Alone in the Dark. Its debut title was released on PC in 1992, and is most often credited as being the creator of survival horror as a whole. Putting these two games side by side, you can definitely see how one inspired the other. Alone in the Dark as its own series is going to have a reimagining of the original game coming out next year, which will put it at a total of eight different games, but for today we're really only interested in one of them. For many, many years this was my only exposure to this series. It's a game that has an atmosphere about it, one that might not be much to me these days, but planted such traumatizing concepts in my childhood self's mind. That game is the 2008 reboot. Now give me my stone! I don't have your stone, and fuck you anyway! You may be asking yourself, how could a kid find this shit scary? That's a very fair question, if I had played the later editions of the game first. See, this reboot was released on the Wii and the PS2, the, these two versions I'm going to dub the older generation, as well as being released on the 360, PC, and a later version on PS3 known as Inferno, which was a bit of like a bug fixing and optimization sort of update. I'll call these the later gen versions for the sake of brevity. When people talk about this game online, more often than not they are talking exclusively about the later gen versions, and that's for a good reason. In many ways it could be considered the better experience if you're only talking about moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Also, visually it's a bit of a step up, as you would expect, you know, PS2 and Wii to like 360, PS3, PC. Now this video is about how this game had a lot of potential and even some genuinely good ideas, but the execution ended up being just so terribly flawed and fell quite flat. I'm not trying to say that any generation of this reboot is considered good. This reboot is considered to be one of the worst Alone in the Dark games ever, probably near the bottom of everybody's totem pole as just only beating out Illumination from 2015. And it's also just a really mediocre to bad game in general. I'm not really arguing with either of those points. I'm also not going to do like a huge beat by beat plot summary, but, but I will give a brief summary. So spoiler alert, I guess, if you care. I, <laughs> I'm not going to talk about literally everything that happens, but you know. After Lucifer was cast out of heaven, he created a stone. This stone would become the Philosopher's Stone of Legend. Lucifer, over time, fostered rumors about its power to ensure that the stone would never be destroyed and it would always be sought after. As the stories go, it's basically the same mythos surrounding the stone in real life. Power, wealth, anything that would entail. Of course, you know, Lucifer is lying so he can use the stone as a means of being resurrected, tempting the hearts of mankind with false promises. Those who come to hold the stone are known as carriers, but those who can actually manipulate its power are called alchemists. And there's been a series of carriers and alchemists over time, but there was one alchemist named Hermes. He realized the truth behind the stone before he could be taken over, and thus he split it in two. And so he would remain underneath what would become Central Park in New York City, building a labyrinth of tunnels, obstacles, and riddles, awaiting the day that the one bearing the stone's other half would arrive in hopes that they'd be strong enough to defeat Lucifer. We see Hermes in-game, and you may be asking, why hasn't this guy died yet? That's because carriers are granted immortality, that's why. I could understand your confusion seeing as Hermes looks to be old enough to have been around when mankind discovered fire. The game takes place in the year 2008 and Lucifer is finally making his move. A group of would-be alchemists have captured both you and this other guy, which is where the game begins. So all that backstory I just talked about, we don't know jack shit going in and thematically speaking, that makes sense. 
The game begins with us awakening on a couch to the sounds of two men arguing about some kind of stone and this thing called the Path of Light, whatever the fuck those things are. Of course, as time goes on, we get more and more filled in about this stuff. It's not much longer before we learn from this old man, whose name is Paddington, that our name is Edward, he's apparently known us for a long time, and we've also been stricken with amnesia due to some ritual being performed on us, which could have gone much worse. Later on, we learn that our full name is Edward Carnby, and we're the same Edward Carnby from Alone in the Dark 1, 2, and 3. The wiki tells me that this game treats 1, 2, and 3 as canon, whilst ignoring the new nightmare, I hear a lot of people really don't like this decision because, like, why does he look so different? It's understandable that he's still, you know, alive considering the stone grants immortality and he came to possess the stone, but why does he look so different? You compare his voice, especially from the first game. On my door, a dull brass plate says, Private Detective to this one in 2008. A what? A restroom? By the way, in the reboot, he's voiced by the same guy who voices Max fucking Payne. Honestly, I'm just indifferent about all of this. Uh, actually, I'm a little bit upset that he didn't keep that bitchin' mustache. Like, what the fuck? And from here, the story is essentially that these alchemists want Paddington to manipulate the stone and lead them to this path of light where they can accomplish their goals no doubt being some sort of world domination, also no doubt they're being manipulated by Lucifer. Simultaneously, Lucifer's stirring shit up on Earth, trying to get both halves of the stone back. As such, these fissures are tearing shit up, corrupting people into monsters, and just generally causing a ruckus. So it's up to us to locate this path of light and not die in the process. I just want to say up front that the soundtrack is the single best part about this game, no matter what version you're playing. Speaking of, if you are familiar with this game's soundtrack, you may have noticed that I haven't been using any of it in this actual video. And that's for a reason far scarier than anything I've ever encountered in my entire life, copyright. Oh, good lord! I would have really loved to have used some of this shit in the video, it's really fucking good. Definitely the biggest part of the game that's stuck with me for as long as I've known it. It was composed by Olivier de Rivier, I think I'm pronouncing that right, and heavily features the mystery of Bulgarian voices, an ensemble that performs modern arrangements of traditional Bulgarian folk melodies, and this group's been around since the 50s. And this is what Wikipedia has listed for their discography, I don't want to butcher these pronunciations. I've left a link to a playlist of the OST in the description, please give it a listen, it's fantastic, it gives all the right vibes. These are the tracks I would recommend the most. The game does have the trappings of a survival horror game you would expect, like limited resources to manage, a generally oppressive atmosphere, controls that take a bit of getting used to, but they aren't ever quite great, like comfortable, things like that. It also has some mechanics that are both good ideas for a horror game, as well as just being interesting in how they're handled, and it would be kind of cool to see them no matter what genre of game they'd appear in. The three mechanics that most exemplify that, in my mind, are healing, your gun, and the inventory. So if you have any medicinal spray, you press down on the D-pad to heal. You move the camera towards a wound, you can give it a little spritz, and then you can bandage it to give yourself some emergency care. The actual process of healing wounds never goes any deeper than that, for the record. Where it actually does get deeper is what I would call the mortal wound system. Some wounds can get to the point of desperation, and they won't heal on their own, and they will kill you if left untreated. Actually, I don't think any wound heals on its own if left untreated, but you know, whatever. You'll know this is happening when the screen starts pulsating and gradually getting more grayscale. You have about seven minutes to patch yourself up or it's game over. The gun isn't all that special aside from the way reloading and checking remaining ammo works. See, when you have the gun out, you don't have like an on-screen UI element that shows you how many rounds you have left. When you're in first person and have the gun out, press L3, you'll remove the magazine to physically look at and count the remaining rounds. You can even do this while moving, which genuinely makes it harder to count. You could be in the middle of a fight, I need to check how many I've got left, because enemies always take a specific amount of bullets, each magazine only holds 10 shots, headshots don't do any extra damage for some reason, I don't, I don't know why. Aiming is a little clunky and not very precise, but not to the point where it's really annoying to use the gun, 
It's just a little uncertain. It's kind of like how in the OG Silent Hill, yeah, there were some guns you could use in that game, but Harry wasn't a very good shot. You kind of had to wait for a lot of enemies to start closing the distance before your chance to actually hit would go up. Because Harry's not a trained military guy, he's just a guy. But yeah, aside from all that, the gun isn't very special. It's just that the way it's handled is quite immersive, aside from the whole headshots not doing any more damage. I don't know. The inventory doesn't really contribute to the scare factor much at all. Unless you have a fear of pockets, I guess. <laughs> Because I'm about 90% sure time freezes around you when you're in there, and also while you're healing yourself. I just think it's pretty neat how Edward has a jacket with all these different pockets lining the inside like you're the fucking Resident Evil 4 merchant. It's this game which gave me an appreciation for real life clothing with inside pockets like that, even if it's only one. It would have made the game a lot more tense if, you know, while you were healing or rifling through your pockets, enemies could still attack you. Which I suppose is a little disappointing, but I can understand why they would have done it like this. The graphics and art direction are murky in a way that I think is appropriate for the game, but there's also a little caveat to that that we'll get to later. But as far as what I think this game does well, that's about it. Just as I would only call a few parts of the game definitely good, I would only identify a few select instances as being legitimately bad. The driving mechanics in a vacuum are just awful, but when you don't need to drive with any sort of accuracy or urgency, they're a tolerable sort of bad. And the main drawback with these cars is that they just don't turn with any urgency. It's as if power steering just doesn't exist in this world. There are two segments where you are being chased and you're driving away from the thing that's chasing you. The first instance is after leaving a parking garage. You're dodging these fissures that are tearing up the road, you're dodging oncoming traffic, and you're also swerving between the rubble of buildings collapsing and falling in your path. The segment only lasts maybe two or three minutes in total, but it's also quite unforgiving of mistakes, requiring a full restart whenever you mess up. It's a very tense and hectic part of the game. Thematically, fucking aces. Practically, it sucks ass. Just, just look at all this shit you have to dodge. Lot of opportunities for mistakes, and if you make one mistake, fuck you, start over. It's made even worse in the later gen versions, especially the Xbox 360 version, since there's a notorious glitch where after you hit the script to jump at the end, sometimes the ground just doesn't load, and you just clip into the void, and you gotta start over because of that. It's not unheard of for this glitch to happen multiple times in a row. The other driving segment starts with some degree of promise. You need to hotwire a car to escape these alchemists who are trying to kill you. You have a very limited amount of time to get the car up and going, which is a wonderfully tense moment. One that is unfortunately followed up by the fact that you need to drive away from them. This segment really illustrates the problems that arise from the lack of good control. It honestly feels like you need to start turning a second or two before you actually hit the turn, or else you're not going to make it. Or you could just hit some level geometry at the perfect angle to make yourself turn right the fuck around, guaranteeing you need to start over. So thanks for that game. I know I said the graphics were an appropriate sort of murky. Now we're getting to the flip side of that. Plain and simple, some things just don't look good. I can accept that this is a PS2 game, but I must also reiterate, it came out in 2008. I understand it's not going to have the same visual fidelity as a PS3, PC, or Xbox 360 game, but the quality of the models in general just really aren't up to par, even compared to other PS2 games that predate it. Just as a comparison, yeah, I know, these two games, there's more than likely a difference in total budget allocated to each game. The art direction is different, I know, I know. It's not the most fair of comparisons, I'm aware. I'm just trying to say that the technology was there. If they had the budget to make use of it, that's a whole other question. So I suppose, that's I wouldn't consider that to be an entirely bad thing. It's more of just a mixed bag than being outright bad. Hmm, speaking of which, this game has combat. It's not deeply detailed by any stretch, but it's also not insultingly bad. It controls decently enough. It's competent. It exists. Melee combat is done by picking up an object like a chair or a fire extinguisher. You hold the L1 button and then flick the right analog stick to do an attack. Flicking the stick in a different direction will give you a different attack. 
Most enemies will only take a few hits to kill. Melee weapons never break, but some of them can burn, and if they burn for long enough, they turn to ash. But as far as I remember, you're never in a situation where you have to hit an enemy with a burning melee weapon. Oh, and speaking of burning, fire works very well on enemies. So well, in fact, that lighting them up will kill them very, very quickly, to the point of absurdity. Most of the time, you'll only ever be able to do that by using your medicinal spray alongside your lighter to have a makeshift flamethrower. That does mean you're literally burning through healing supplies, which is an element of the game I do appreciate. It's decision-making with your resources. But it's not quite on the level of other games because of the aforementioned effectiveness of fire, as well as medicinal spray being just all over the place. I think you can hold on to two full cans of it at once, and each can gives you somewhere around 10 sprays, and you only need one little to set something on fire. And that one little is gonna just incinerate it within a few seconds. It also only takes one little spritz to heal a wound, of which you can only have, I think, five at once. I can only think of one instance where you're fighting anywhere close to 10 enemies at once, and even then, you're able to catch multiple enemies ablaze with a single puff, you know? It, and the enemies in question, you only ever fight them twice in the entire game, but they have this, like, mucus, spit, vomit attack which clouds your vision. You clear this by blinking your eyes. Oh yeah, I, I forgot to mention! You can manually blink your eyes in this game. It's actually the very first mechanic the game introduces and it's almost as quickly thrown to the fucking wayside, only ever being useful for getting rid of this debuff and helping you solve the occasional puzzle. And that is quite disappointing, because how many games can you think of that have fucking blinking as a game mechanic? Besides this, I can only ever think of SCP Containment Breach and Before Your Eyes. Literally, that's it. It's such a unique mechanic, and it's hardly given the attention it deserves, and that is so disappointing. To be fair, it is used in one of the better puzzles of the game, so there's that. Puzzles in this game exist. The solutions tend to be very painfully simple, aside from the one that requires you to use the blinking mechanic, which is just a step up from all the others, but it's okay. It's just okay. Most of the time, puzzles are just a matter of either trial and error, or you're trying to figure out what object the game wants you to interact with. And that's another thing. Sometimes the object you need to interact with isn't very clearly telegraphed because of the graphics and art direction. Like uh, here, for instance. You need to step out onto these ruined tracks to jump out and grab this rope so you can climb up. It sure as fuck didn't look like I had to do that since the rope can be hard to see from most angles. It honestly looked like I needed to try and jump across here or something, but no, you can't. One of the items you get at the very start of Chapter 3 is Paddington's PDA, and seeing as this was a person's phone before they kind of... Yeah, it's got a bunch of his personal contacts in there, like, it's as if you just picked up somebody else's cell phone and now have access to it. You get to see things like messages they've received. You can look through their contacts. You can dial phone num- You can dial phone numbers. Ah, oh, Jenny will know what to do. We're sorry. All lines are busy. Please try your call again later. Ah, shit. Must have changed her number. I don't think it's possible for you to dial anybody's number and have the call go through in this game. There are plenty of contacts and phone numbers listed in the PDA, but that's a no-go. The main purpose of the PDA is to serve as a vehicle for some lore. But my favorite part about the PDA is in the contacts, there's just a, like a local pizza joint listed. <laughs> it's just a, just a funny little humanizing tidbit that you might not ever see. Because this PDA does not fucking matter in this game. It's used in some cutscenes, but like, you never once have to pull it out and actually use it in the game. So in conclusion, this game is just all over the damn place. There is some legitimate scare factor to the game. I mean, throughout the experience, you're fighting creatures who were definitely once human. Even worse, like these fissures aren't random. They're sentient and they want to kill you. 
You're barely holding on, barely surviving against horrors from beyond the mortal coil. There are game mechanics which do support the horror aspects of the game, and it's all conducive to an atmosphere that can be utterly suffocating, and it's the primary reason why this game shook childhood me as much as it did. Just imagine it's a normal, ordinary day, and suddenly it's turned into a goddamn nightmare. Not only is everything being destroyed around you, it's not being done by any sort of happenstance. It is a sinister, concentrated malice, literally hell-bent on conquering the world, led by none other than Lucifer. I was 10 when this game came out, and probably was first exposed to it around age 12, like I said. It planted ideas of the apocalypse in my mind. The idea that anything and everything I've ever known or cared about could just be gone like that. To the mind of a child, especially one growing up around the time of the rumors that, you know, the world might end in 2012, you remember that? It's not exactly easy to reconcile. Look, I was both a kid and a complete fucking dumbass then, okay? The only thing that's changed is I now have a high school diploma. The soundtrack is, pardon the pun, instrumental to all of this, and god damn do I wish I could have used any of it here without any sort of consequence. As for which version of the reboot is the best to actually play, I don't know, there's pros and cons for both. Now give me my stone! I don't have your stone, and fuck you anyway! I mean, that one was pretty good, but like, I don't see how that makes- I'm the light bringer! I'M THE FUCKING UNIVERSE! No, yeah, this one wins.